Hi everybody, welcome back to our Jane Eyre read-along. I hope you had a great weekend. If you'll remember where we left off on Friday, uh, we finished up a chapter where some strange things happened. Mason was bitten and stabbed by somebody, supposedly Grace Poole, and Jane helped um, keep Mason awake until the doctor came and they, he got bandaged up and left. And Rochester's hiding the whole thing. They had a strange conversation in the garden where it seemed like he was going to tell her something, but then he changed his mind and he's talking about marrying Blanche Ingram. So today we're going to start with the first section of chapter 21. 21 is a really long chapter, so we're just going to read the first third of it today and then tomorrow we'll read the middle and then the end on the next day. So thanks so much for joining me and let's get started. Presentiments are strange things, and so are sympathies, and so are signs, and the three combined to make one mystery to which humanity has not yet found the key. I never laughed at presentiments in my life, because I have had strange ones of my own. Sympathies, I believe, exist, for instance, between far distant, long absent, wholly estranged relatives asserting, notwithstanding their alienation, the unity of the source to which each traces his origin whose workings baffle mortal comprehension, and signs, ought we know, may be but the sympathies of nature with man. When I was a little girl, only six years old, one night I heard Bessie Levin say to Martha Abbott that she had been dreaming about a little child, and that to dream of children was a sure sign of trouble, either to oneself or one's kin. The saying might have worn out of my memory had not a circumstance immediately followed which served indelibly to fix it there. The next day, Bessie was sent for home to the deathbed of her little sister. Of late, I had often recalled this saying and this incident, for during the, the past week, scarcely a night had gone over my couch that had not brought with it a dream of an infant, which I sometimes hushed in my arms, sometimes dandled on my knee, sometimes watched playing with daisies on a lawn, or again, dabbling its hands in running water. It was a wailing child this night. To meet me the moment I entered the land of slumber. I did not like this iteration of one idea, this strange recurrence of one image and I grew nervous as bedtime approached and the hour of the vision drew near. It was from companionship with this baby phantom I had been roused on the moonlit night when I heard the cry, and it was on the afternoon of the day following I was summoned downstairs by a message that someone wanted me in Mrs. Fairfax's room. On repairing thither, I found a man waiting for me, having the appearance of a gentleman's servant. He was dressed in deep mourning, and the hat he held in his hand was surrounded with a crape band. "'I dare say you hardly remember me, miss,' he said, rising as I entered. "'But my name is Levin. I lived coachman with Mrs. Reed when you were at Gateshead, eight or nine years since, and I live there still. Oh, Robert, how do you do? I remember you very well. You used to give me a ride sometimes on Miss Georgiana's bay pony. And how is Bessie? You are married to Bessie?' Yes, miss, my wife is very hearty, thank you. She brought me another little one about two months since. We have three now, and both mother and child are thriving. And are the family well at the house, Robert? I'm sorry I can't give you better news of them, miss. They are very badly at present, in great trouble. I hope no one is dead, I said, glancing at his black dress. He too looked down at the crepe round his hat and replied, Mr. John died yesterday, was a week, at his chambers in London. Mr. John? Yes. And how does his mother bear it? Why, you see, Miss Eyre, it is not a common mishap. His life has been very wild. These last three years he gave himself up to strange ways, and his death was shocking. I heard from Bessie he was not doing well. Doing well? He could not do worse. He ruined his health and his estate amongst the worst men and the worst women. He got into debt and into jail. His mother helped him out twice, but as soon as he was free, he returned to his old companions and habits. His head was not strong. The knaves he lived amongst fooled him beyond anything I ever heard. 
He came down to Gateshead about three weeks ago and wanted Mrs. to give up all to him. Mrs. refused. Her means have long been much reduced by his extravagance. So he went back again, and the next news was that he was dead. How he died, God knows. They say he killed himself. I was silent. The tidings were frightful. Robert Levin resumed. Mrs. had been out of health herself for some time. She had got very stout, but was not strong with it, and the loss of money and fear of poverty were quite breaking her down. The information about Mr. John's death and the manner of it came too suddenly. It brought on a stroke. She was three days without speaking, but last Tuesday she seemed rather better. She appeared as if she wanted to say something and kept making signs to my wife and mumbling. It was only yesterday morning, however, that Bessie understood she was pronouncing your name, and at last she made out the words, Bring Jane, fetch Jane Eyre, I want to speak to her. Bessie is not sure whether she is in her right mind or means anything by the words, but she told Miss Reed and Miss Georgiana I'd advise them to send for you. The young ladies put it off at first, but their mother grew so restless and said, Jane, Jane, so many times, that they at last consented. I left Gateshead yesterday, and if you can get ready, miss, I should like to take you back with me early tomorrow morning. Yes, Robert, I shall be ready. It seems to me that I ought to go. I think so too, miss. Bessie said she was sure you would not refuse, but I suppose you will have to ask leave before you can get off. Yes, and I will do it now. And having directed him to the servants' hall and recommended him to the care of John's wife and the attentions of John himself, I went in search of Mr. Rochester. He was not in any of the lower rooms. He was not in the yard, the stables, or the grounds. I asked Mrs. Fairfax if she had seen him. Yes, she believed he was playing billiards with Miss Ingram. To the billiard room I hastened. The click of balls and the hum of voices resounded thence. Mr. Rochester, Miss Ingram, the two Misses Eshton, and their admirers were all busied in the game. It required some courage to disturb so interesting a party. My errand, however, was one I could not defer, so I approached the master where he stood at Miss Ingram's side. She turned as I drew near and looked at me haughtily. Her eyes seemed to demand, how can that creeping creature want something now? And when I said in a low voice, Mr. Rochester, she made a movement as if tempted to order me away. I remember her appearance at the moment. It was very graceful and very striking. She wore a morning robe of sky blue crepe. A gauzy azure scarf was twisted in her hair. She had been all animation with the game and irritated pride did not lower the expression of her haughty lineaments. Does that person want you? She inquired of Mr. Rochester and Mr. Rochester turned to see who that person was. He made a curious grimace, one of his strange and equivocal demonstrations, threw down his cue, and followed me from the room. Well, Jane, he said, as he rested his back against the schoolroom door, which he had shut. If you please, sir, I want a leave of absence for a week or two. What to do? Where to go? To see a sick lady who has sent for me. What sick lady? Where does she live? In Gateshead, in Shire. Shire, that is a hundred miles off. Who may she be that sends for people to see her at that distance? Her name is Reed, sir, Mrs. Reed. Reed of Gateshead? There was a Reed of Gateshead, a magistrate. It is his widow, sir. And what have you to do with her? How do you know her? Mrs. Mr. Reed was my uncle, my mother's brother. The deuce he was, you never told me that before. You always said you had no relations. None that would own me, sir. Mr. Reed is dead, and his wife cast me off. Why? Because I was poor and burdensome, and she disliked me. But Reed left children? You must, you must have cousins. Sir George Lynn was talking of a Reed of Gateshead yesterday, who, he said, was one of the veriest rascals in town, and Ingram was mentioning a, mentioning a Georgiana Reed of the same place, who is much admired for her beauty a season or two ago in London. John Reed is dead too, sir. He ruined himself and half ruined his family and is supposed to have committed suicide. The news so shocked his mother that it brought on an apoplectic attack. 
And what good can you do her? Nonsense, Jane. I would never think of running a hundred miles to see an old lady who will, perhaps, be dead before you reach her. Besides, you say she cast you off. Yes, sir, but that was long ago, and when her circumstances were very different. I could not be easy to neglect her wishes now. How long will you stay? As short a time as possible, sir. Promise me only to stay a week. I'd better not pass my word. I might be obliged to break it. At all events, you will come back. You will not be induced under any pretext to take up a permanent residence with her. Oh, no, I shall certainly return if all be well. And who goes with you? You don't travel a hundred miles alone. No, sir. She has sent her coachman. A person to be trusted? Yes, sir. He has lived ten years in the family. Mr. Rochester meditated. When do you wish to go? Early tomorrow morning, sir. Well, you must have some money. You can't travel without money, and I dare say you have not much. I've given you no salary yet. How much have you in the world, Jane? He asked, smiling. I drew out my purse, a meager thing it was. Five shillings, sir. He took the purse, poured over the hoard into his palm, and chuckled over it as if its scantiness amused him. Soon he produced his pocketbook. Here, he said, offering me a note. It was fifty pounds. He owed me but fifteen. I told him I had no change. I don't want change, you know that. Take your wages. I declined, accepting more than was my due. He scowled at first, then, as if recollecting something, he said, Right, right. Better not give you all now. You would, perhaps, stay away three months if you had fifty pounds. There are ten. Is it not plenty? Yes, sir, but now you owe me five. Come back for it, then. I am your banker for forty pounds. Mr. Rochester, I may as well mention another matter of business to you while I have the opportunity. Matter of business? I am curious to hear it. You have as good as informed me, sir, that you are going shortly to be married? Yes, what then? In that case, sir, Adele ought to go to school. I'm sure you will perceive the necessity of it. To get her out of my bride's way, who might otherwise walk over her rather too emphatically? There's, a, there's sense in your suggestion, not a doubt of it. Adele, as you say, must go to school. And you, of course, much, must march straight to the devil? I hope not, sir, but I must seek other situations somewhere. In course, he exclaimed, with a twang of voice and a distortion of features equally fantastic and ludicrous. He looked at me some minutes. An old Madame Reed, or the Misses, her daughters, will be solicited by you to seek a place, I suppose? No, sir, I am not on such terms with my relatives as would justify me in asking favors of them, but I shall advertise. You shall walk up the pyramids of Egypt, he growled. At your peril, you advertise. I wish I'd only offered you a sovereign instead of ten pounds. Give me back nine pounds, Jane. I have use for it. And so have I, sir, I returned, putting my hands on my purse behind me. I could not spare the money on any account. You, said he, refusing me my request. Give me five pounds, Jane. Not five shillings, sir, nor five pence. Just let me look at the cash. No, sir, you are not to be trusted. Jane, sir, promise me one thing. I'll promise you anything, sir, that I think I am likely to perform. Not to advertise and to trust this quest of a situation to me. I'll find you one in time. I shall be glad to do so, sir, if you, in your turn, will promise that I and Adele shall be both safe out of the house before your bride enters it. Very well, very well. I'll pledge my word on it. You go tomorrow, then. Yes, sir, early. Shall you come down to the drawing room after dinner? No, sir, I must prepare for the journey. Then you and I must bid goodbye for a little while. I suppose so, sir. And how do people perform that ceremony of parting, Jane? Teach me. I'm not quite up to it. They say farewell, or any other form they prefer. Then say it. Farewell, Mr. Rochester, for the present. What must I say? The same, if you like, sir. Farewell, Miss Eyre, for the present. Is that all? Yes. It seems stingy to my notions, and dry and unfriendly. I should like something else. 
a little addition to the right, if one shook hands, for instance. But no, that would not content me either. So you'll do no more than say farewell, Jane? It is enough, sir, as much goodwill may be conveyed in one hearty word as in many. Very likely, but it is blank and cool. Farewell. How long is he going to stand with his back against the door, I ask myself. I want to commence my packing. The dinner bell rang, and suddenly away he bolted without another syllable. I saw him no more during the day, and it was off before he had risen in the morning. I reached the lodge at Gateshead about five o'clock in the afternoon on the 1st of May. I stepped in there before going up to the hall. It was very clean and neat. The ornamental windows were hung with little white curtains. The floor was spotless. The grate and fire irons were burnished bright, and the fire burnt clear. Bessie sat on the hearth, nursing her last born, and Robert and his sister played quietly in a corner. "'Bless you! I knew you would come!' exclaimed Mrs. Levin as I entered. "'Yes, Bessie,' said I, after I had kissed her. "'And I trust I am not too late. How is Mrs. Reed? Alive still, I hope?' "'Yes, she's alive, and more sensible and collected than she was. "'The doctor says she may linger a week or two yet, but he hardly thinks she will finally recover.' Has she mentioned me lately? She was talking of you only this morning and wishing you would come, but she is sleeping now, or was ten minutes ago when I was up at the house. She generally lies in a kind of lethargy all the afternoon and wakes up about six or seven. Will you rest yourself here an hour, miss, and then I will go up with you? Robert here entered, and Bessie laid her sleeping child in the cradle and went to welcome him. Afterwards, she insisted on my taking off my bonnet and having some tea, for she said I looked pale and tired. I was glad to accept her hospitality, and I submitted to be relieved of my traveling garb, just as passively as I used to let her undress me when I was a child. So that brings us to the end of the third of the chapter that we're going to read today. So Jane's going to go and see Mrs. Reed, which she said she was never going to do again when she was a kid, but I guess this is supposed to show that she's grown up and matured, so she's going to go visit her aunt. There are some family revelations coming up soon. Jane learned some things about um, her family that she didn't know before that Mrs. Reed hid from her, and we learn a little bit about the Mrs. Reed and how they have changed over time. The one thing I like about this section is you sort of see how it's sort of karma, you know, they weren't great kids, they weren't great to Jane, and it sort of affects them later on in life. So maybe we'll read that part tomorrow. I'm not quite sure what's in the middle here, but it's definitely coming up soon. Thanks so much for joining me. Have a good rest of your day and stay safe.